I mean, when I started this, I was getting laughed off the water by my fellow fishermen. And everybody was joking around that I was, you know, growing hemp under the ocean and no one, this stuff was disgusting and, you know, why would you ever do this? And now we have folks just flooding towards us. We have requests to start farms in every coastal state in North America and 40 countries around the world. There he is, how you doing? Very good. You know, kelp is a little embarrassing to grow for a for a fisherman. You know, I, ch I chase and kill things for a living, and now I'm like an arugula farmer, and so it's a big shift. But kelp really is what the oceans provide. So my name is Bren Smith. I'm the owner of Thimble Island Ocean Farm and executive director of Green Wave. And I'm, this is my 30th year working the ocean. I was born and raised in Newfoundland, Canada. Dropped out of high school when I was 14 and headed out to sea. And I really spent the first third of my life just fishing the globe. I fished the Grand Banks, George's Banks. I had to do a Bering Sea for quite a, a bunch of years. And, um, you know, that was the height of overfishing. There was, you know, we were pillaging the, the oceans, tearing up entire ecosystems. And I, but I was a kid, and it uh, really gave me a lot, an incredible sense of meaning to help feed my country and be on the water. And that's kind of been the goal over my whole life is how do we figure out that so people like me and other fishermen and even land-based farmers can, can have their own farms, have self-directed lives, and, and um, you know, spend their, make their livelihoods out in the water. While I was working on the Bering Sea, the, the cod stalks crashed back home where I was born in Newfoundland. And that was a real wake-up call for a whole generation of us. And so me and a bunch of people my age went on this search for sustainability. And I ended up in the uh, aquaculture farms in northern Canada because aquaculture was supposed to be the answer to overfishing, job creation. But when I got there, it was the exact opposite. It was, it was an industrial mode of for, uh, food production. We used to say we're growing neither fish nor food. So uh, I ended up here in Long Island Sound uh, as I kept searching for a new way to, to farm the ocean. And I re remade myself as a shell fisherman, and I started with oysters. And I did that for about eight years, and then the storms hit. Hurricane Irene and Hurricane Sandy were really brutal. They were, you know, they were two very hard years, having the farm wiped out, 90% of my crop lost, and most of my gear. And after, uh, I think it was Irene, I went out too early to go to, sa to try to save the farm and I started pulling gear and uh, uh, I, I ended up getting blown into the rocks and had to be uh, you know, uh, saved by the Coast Guard. And that was just me just wanting to save what I had in the, in, in the face of uh, climate change. But I was farming in the wrong way then is what it turned out and that's why I had to adapt. After the storms hit, I had to reimagine what it was to be an ocean farmer. And so I began trying to grow different species, species that were more resilient, um, species that were actually more affordable to grow. And I lifted my farm off bottom using the entire water column, which made me resilient to storm surges. And I started growing species that were restorative, uh, like oysters, but many, many more. And the idea was really how many different species can we grow in a 20 acre area. And the idea is just to make this as affordable as possible for farmers to, to do and do themselves. So it's just minimal skills and, and minimal capital costs. I'm saying this is, we think of this as the nail salon model of the sea. And simplicity is really the secret to replication. You know, you, you come out on the farm and there's kind of nothing to see. But, you know, that's a good thing. It's all underwater, low aesthetic impact, small footprint. Um, 
but if you can imagine an underwater garden. So the farm, all it is, imagine a sort of simple scaffolding system underwater where you have hurricane-proof anchors on the edges, and then just about eight feet below the surface, you have a horizontal rope. And we, so we'll have our kelp growing vertically um, uh, down on the lines next to scallops and lantern nets, next to mussels and mussel socks, and then below the surface, we have oyst our oysters and cages and clams down in the mud. Scientists call it IMTA, Integrated Multitropic uh, aquaculture. The worst name I think anybody could have ever come up with. Uh, like, I mean, it's alienating uh, from the start. And so we're trying to create this whole new dialect around ocean farming. So we decided on 3D ocean farming because it's an idea, I think, that captures people's imagination. They don't know what it is at first, but it gets them to lean forward. Just taking some of this slack to like right here. The growing season, uh, kelp is a winter crop, it's why we love it, it goes in post-hurricane season, one of the fastest growing plants on earth. Um, so we seed that around November, and it, it grows, we start harvesting in the spring. We pull the kelp off the lines to process, and right then we have mussel sets, little mussel seeds that come and attach to those old pieces of the kelp stems. And they grow out, and we take that seed and put them in mussel socks, and we attach those mussel socks to those old kelp lines. So really efficient use of gear. The scallops, we're harvesting those in as many scallops, again, just before kelp comes. Oysters are year-round, and then clams are mainly in the spring and summer. So we're able to harvest something all year round, we have diversification, which reduces risk for us as farmers if one of our uh, crops fail. All right, then turn it up. I'm on it. Oops. Got it. Okay, you grab the line, then walk down it, clip it. So these are our mussel socks here. And we love mussels. They're packed full of omega-3s. It's lean proteins. So such an e efficient use of gear, rotational crop, really simple. And then what the mussels do is they push through the netting and they grow on the outside. And then we get those the, the delicious mussels. We harvest those just before kelp season. Regenerative agriculture to me is trying to answer the question of how do we farm the ocean in a different way? How do we revive ecosystems through our farming methods? So my job isn't to save the seas. It's because Mother Nature millions of years ago created two technologies actually designed to mitigate our harm, shellfish and seaweeds. A shellfish, our oysters soak up uh, uh, incredible amounts of nitrogen. They filter over 50 gallons of water a day. Our kelp soaks up five times more carbon than land-based plants. I mean, there are studies coming out that says if you were to have farms covering 6% of the oceans, you could capture all the carbon that's currently put out by humanity and feed the planet. Kelp is a type of seaweed. There are over 200 varieties um, in our waters and uh, it's a brown algae. Ours is called sugar kelp. The interesting thing about kelp and why I see it as a great gateway drug for the future of sea greens is that our kelp is really mild tasting. It's in the, uh, uh, the southern edge of a sugar kelp. You blanch it and it turns this bright green so it's a really nice aesthetic. We turn it into noodles. So what we're making here is our kelp noodles, which are, uh, uh, we find is, uh, it sells out in New York City all the time. One of the best dishes we do is a barbecue kelp noodles with parsnips and breadcrumbs. And we like it because the kelp uh, freezes for up to five years, so um, it has incredible shelf life. And when you thaw it, it stays al dente. And it's also bright green, so the aesthetics are uh, really great. So Asa here, who's the operations manager, is going to start making some kelp noodles. This is 
The other thing that's interesting about kelp specifically, uh, kelp can be used for animal feed. It's like a soy or a corn without the destructive uh, impacts. Kelp is also used in pharmaceuticals, in cosmetics, as fertilizers. The biofuel potential, if you were to take a network of farms totaling the size of the state of Maine, you could replace all the oil in the United States. As we scale this, now some of it might work, some of it might not, but it shows the possibility and the promise as we move out into our oceans and, and you know, do agriculture the, the right way. This isn't just some little, like, you know, tiny thing. We're going to do it in restaurants in New York. If we care about building a vibrant economy, this has to be able to scale. Because we can grow huge amounts of food in small places, like 10 to 30 um, uh, tons of seaweed, 250,000 shellfish per acre, the um, impact on food security can be um, uh, really significant. If you were to take a network of our farms totaling the size of Washington State, you could feed the world. The other, th you know, the other piece is we cr create thousands and thousands of jobs. I mean, one of our small farms creates two to three full-time jobs and seven to ten seasonal jobs. You put together thousands of farms dotting our, dotting our coastline, I mean that, that's a significant workforce that's not just in the service sector, it's not just working in cubicles, it's actually jobs where people have a sense of meaning, they have their own farms, and they're good wages, wages where people can send their kids to college and really address some of the real injustices that have evolved out of the old, old economy. You know, I spent 15 years developing my model. It took a long time, a lot of mistakes, errors. Um, uh, it was kind of a mess, um, tons of experimentation. Um, but what emerged was 3D ocean farming. Thousands of people started coming, um, asking to start their own farms, wanting to be involved, wanting to help do their research. So we started Green Wave. Green Wave does three things. Trying to build this industry from the bottom up by one, training new, a new generation of farmers. Second, building the infrastructure on land. So we build the hatcheries, the seafood hubs, so that farmers can capture more of that value chain. And then the last piece is R&D and science. All that um, innovation that's required uh, to expand markets. I think the economic potential is huge. Our farmers can do extremely well. They can uh, gross up to $300,000 for their farms. And, and then what they grow can cre create an entire uh, range of different um, opportunities for entrepreneurs. So we can do the kelp raised beef, we can do fertilizers, we can do new pharmaceuticals, uh, bouillon cubes. I mean, it's just infinite because it is like the soy of the sea. And then you start getting to a point that's at scale we, where you can actually participate uh, in the national and the global economy. And I think that's where we you know, really hope to be big. It's a, it's a big dream, but I think we can pull it off.